everyone and welcome to the fourth meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing. We have no apologies. Agenda item one is uh, taking a decision in private. Um, um, it's a discussion on the subcommittee's work programme. Are members content to undertake that? Panel? Thank you very much indeed. Agenda item two is uh, the Counter Corruption Unit. Um, um, and this is an evidence session on Durham Constabulary's report on Police Scotland's <coughs> Counter Corruption Unit. And I would refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private briefing. And I welcome the Deputy Chief Constable Rose Fitzpatrick, um, Duncan Campbell, Interim Head of Legal Services, and Superintendent Andy McDowell of the Professional Standards Department of Police Scotland. Um, and thank you for written submissions. And we'll go straight to questions. And the first question is Daniel. Well, thank you very much, convener. Um, can I begin really by looking at, I think, this is the central contention, which is that the status of the work that was undertaken by Durham Constabulary. Now, if I could just quote the letter that you, uh, the Police Scotland, wrote to um, Durham on the 28th of July 2016, the first paragraph, it uh, asks with their agreement for the Durham Constabulary to undertake, and I quote, an independent investigation relative to the non-criminal complaint uh, allegations I identified by Ayoko. And then I also note that we've had a more recent letter um, from the Investigative Powers Tribunal, which again sets out their um, query about the nature of that work, in, in which they, they go on to say that, that um, you have not, in accordance with their order, referred the matter to the Durham Force for investigation, ask for your response. Well, I understand that you've provided that response. But given the language of your initial letter, given the understandings of the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, it's, it's understandable that Durham are conf confused and indeed perhaps upset about the, the ambiguity about the nature of the investigation and indeed whether it was an investigation or not. What, what, what would you say to that? that summary and analysis of, of, of those understandings and the communications that, that there have been with regard to this matter? Um, well, the first thing I would say is that I'm very grateful to Durham Constabulary for their very thorough and um, professional report, which was produced to us under their terms of reference. The terms of reference and the letter that uh, you refer to asks them to undertake an independent investigation, as you say, relative to the non-criminal complaint allegations. Um, it, it's not, I suppose, it shouldn't be a surprise that in anything as important and complex as this matter clearly is, that uh, at particular times we should all want to make sure that we are operating in, in uh, accordance with the terms of reference and particularly importantly that we're operating effectively under the, uh, the law as it uh, exists in Scotland. So um, when, uh, when I was first asked by the Chief Constable of Police Scotland to become the, effectively the decision maker in this matter, which was in January and formally appointed to that role by him in February 2017, I was engaging uh, straight away with Mr Barton to discuss the progress of their complaints investigation and also to establish whether uh, progress was being made and whether there are any, uh, were any issues I could assist with. And when he made it clear that uh, there were some issues for him around the terms of reference and in particular the regulations un under which he was conducting his investigation, which are the Police Scotland Conduct Regulations 2014, I, of course, listened very carefully to that. Um, it's, it's not unusual for, in, in complex matters for there to be a, a, a difference of professional view about the best way of progressing things. But we were very clear that he and Durham Constabulary had been asked to undertake an independent investigation only into the complaints um, allegations, the non-criminal complaints allegations, and that our conduct regulations require other stages to take place um, should there require to be a, an, an investigation then into the conduct of individual officers. And we had, as, as the uh, committee will be aware, we had a number of discussions about that. Um, Mr Barton very helpfully came up to uh, discuss that with me in person on the 30th of January 2017. 
And we, um, I listened very carefully to what he, he said, and I, I felt it was actually my responsibility to take legal advice, um, and the committee will have seen the senior counsel's opinion that we received, uh, which made it clear that because we were operating under the conduct regulations 2014, we uh, needed to go through the process that's set out in those regulations, and that effectively, uh, we would need to continue to, to carry out an assessment in order for me to make a decision whether there should then be a conduct investigation, and if so, who should be appointed to undertake it. Both of those investigations were conducted independently. Durham's investigation, clearly independent of us, and their conclusions arrived at independently, and then the separate conduct investigation undertaken by the Police Service of Northern Ireland, again, their conclusions arrived at independently. So you uh, raised the matter of the regulations, which we had a considerable degree of discussion uh, when, Mr. Mo um, uh, when Chief Constable Barton was in, in front of us. And indeed, can I just refer to the official record of that meeting and about the preliminary assessment? And I understand the importance of that, given the, the different nature about the way complaints are made um, in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK. I, I understand that. But, but the evidence in terms of preliminary said it was somewhat worrying, and, and, I'll, and I'll quote from the official record, and, th and this is from uh, Darren Ellis. I was initially told that a preliminary assessment had been completed. I was then told that one had not been completed. Then I was told that one had been completed and lost. And after that, I was told again that one had not been completed. Over six to eight weeks, I tried to identify the starting point and what Police Scotland considered to be the views of the four complainants and the IPT because an assessment of that would dictate the play. I do not believe that the work was ever done. And, and, and further that he added um, that, that uh, in responding to, to Chief Constable Barton about whether or not they, they knew at that, even at that point, and Darnell said, we do not know. Now, given the importance of that preliminary assessment, as you acknowledge, is that not a deeply worrying state of affairs and a worrying report, both in terms of um, the lack of clarity and indeed the prospect that, that such an assessment hadn't been carried out. What would you say to that? What I, what, what I would say is that a preliminary assessment is a very important part of the process that leads from a complaints investigation and determines whether there will be a conduct investigation thereafter. And so when we received Durham's report, um, so Durham had conducted their investigation, they were asked to do the work, as, as you quite rightly say, in July and August of 2016. Um, I believe Mr. Mr. Ellis and, and his team were appointed um, to, take, to, to progress the work further uh, in November, certainly late 2016. Um, when they completed their report and provided it to us in May, 2017, that then triggered, under the regulations, the conduct regulations, um, section 10, that then triggered what, what is known as a preliminary assessment, which essentially enables me to look at the conclusions from the complaints inquiry uh, and the re result of their investigation um, and to decide on the basis of that, um, in this case, Durham having identified that there were a number of officers whose conduct, if proven, um, might amount to misconduct. Um, I agreed with that assessment. I agreed with their conclusions in my preliminary assessment, and my decision-making, um, that a number of those officers should be subject of a conduct inquiry to determine whether, on the basis of the evidence that that, that inquiry and investigation would look at, um, should they then subsequently, for example, face misconduct proceedings. So that was the point at which the regulations provide for that preliminary assessment to, to be the bridge between the complaints allegations and any subsequent misconduct investigation. So just to recap, we had confusion and perhaps disagreement in terms of the, the status of the work that, they, that, that Durham Constabulary were, were carrying out. We had a difference of opinion about uh, the, the interpretation of the regulations that we've heard from Mr. Barton. And we have a, a kind of, a, a, at best, a lack of clarity um, from Durham Constabulary about the, 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 whether or not a preliminary assessment, which we can all agree is a very important step in this process, existed or not. Now, that strikes me that these are three fundamental and very important bits where the, there is 
uh, was a fundamental uh, 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 difference of understanding between Police Scotland and Durham Constabulary over what we can all agree is a very serious and an important matter. Does that not speak to a very worrying situation? And how would you explain that? And what, what, what lessons have you taken um, from, from this situation? Well, it, it clearly is a really important um, issue for all of us. Um, we, we have been very clear that our failings in uh, 2015, which were the subject of the IOCO um, report and IPT judgment and order, um, were severe. Uh, and we were also very um, clear that our responsibility was to provide uh, Durham Constabulary with all the support they would need to conduct their own independent uh, complaints investigation. So when I took up that responsibility to be the decision maker um, towards the end of January 2017, I met with Mr Barton. We spoke on many occasions about a number of um, issues around the progress of, the, uh, of his investigation, and he raised, as I said with me, the, the issue around the terms of reference. Um, we were all very uh, conscious of our responsibilities to make sure that this was all undertaken under the conduct regulations as they provide, uh, and also to make sure that, um, from my point of view, if there were any issues that Mr Barton required to be resolved or um, any material that he needed, that we could resolve those along the way. And you will see, I hope, from the exchange of letters that we were able to do that um, as we went. Um, I, I, these, these were very complex and important issues. I, I, I'm, I didn't find it surprising that Mr Barton and Durham Constabulary should want to progress in the way that they thought fit. Um, I certainly was very conscious of my responsibility to make sure that we were progressing clearly in line with the conduct regulations as they exist. And as I understand it, we both, when, when the moment came to de determine the issue about um, Durham being able to move from the complaints investigation straight into a conduct investigation, I felt very clearly that I had a responsibility to take um, proper legal advice about that. And you will see that we took senior counsel's opinion. So... What we then agreed to do was to progress on the basis of the original terms of reference and under the Conduct Regulations 2014. And if I may, when we received Mr Barton's report on the 12th of May, he, his, his letter um, acknowledges that point. He says, My team found your colleagues to be helpful and professional, and for that I thank you. Please pass on my thanks to them. My report is not as prompt as I would have liked. There were necessary delays taking legal clarification on the status of my inquiry. I'm glad to say that was ultimately resolved. And he goes on to say, I have, I trust, helpfully referred further to this issue in the lessons learnt chapter. That's of his final investigation report. So I think we all acknowledged that this was an issue um, where there was a professional difference of view, and ultimately we resolved that and agreed to proceed on the basis of the terms of reference and the interpretation by senior counsel of the conduct regulations as they uh, operate in Scotland. Um, just finally, Camille, just on that answer, I'm st struggling, frankly, to reconcile what you're telling me uh, with comp in comparison to, to what Chief Constable Barton said, because if we were to, to sort of take your evidence as you've just put it, uh, it would sound like you had left things in a very amicable and, and, a, 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 and in a way where all parties understood one another. And yet, you know, Chief Constable Barton, in her evidence, you characterised uh, Police Scotland, in particular the legal department, as acting in an overly legalistic way and a risk averse way. And I, I think the, the conclusion that, that, that one would draw from that was that essentially that, that, that procedure was getting in the way of, of, of looking after the wronged police officers. If everything was so amicable, how, why was Chief Constable Barton giving the evidence that he gave to this committee if there's nothing wrong? I think I've reflected the fact that we did have a significant difference of professional view. 
which was resolved by the taking of legal advice and an agreement that we would proceed on the basis of the original terms of reference uh, that Durham Constabulary were given and the, um, the legal advice, the two sets of legal advice, which we'd received from senior counsel. And I think Mr Barton's letter of the, the 12th of May reflect that, reflects that. I, I've spoken and, and read from his letter the point about the lessons learnt in, the, in that part of his report and um, the committee will be aware that we have been very keen to make sure that all of the lessons learned from um, each of the individual independent uh, reports that we've had from the IOCO report, the IPT judgment and order, through to HMICS's 39 recommendations on their assurance review of the CCU, uh, right through to, to Northumbria, Durham, and the PSNI report, there's been learning for us in all of those issues, which sits alongside the actual findings of those investigations. And um, a huge amount of work has already gone on, um, certainly on the 39 recommendations from the HMI CS review. So we are very clear that where there are things to be learned about the processes, for example, um, with Durham Constabulary, then we will take those on. And, and as I said uh, as well, you know, there were, I, I, I don't for a moment suggest that there weren't points that Mr Barton raised with me in our many conversations and our exchanges of letters where he felt that actually we could provide something to him um, or provide uh, more perhaps a little more support to his team. And as soon as I became aware of those, then we resolved those issues as we went along. Um, but as I say, it's a co it was a complex matter. It went on for a long time. So I am not surprised with all of us determined to do the to proceed in the right way that there would have been differences of opinion and but as as you can see from Mr. Barton's final letter to us, I believe that they were resolved ultimately by the way that we agreed to proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. And I, I know Stuart's wanting in with a supplementary. If I can just ask you three very brief points, uh, uh, Deputy Chief Constable, and that is, you're the disciplinary authority for, for Police Scotland. Could you have, on receipt of the IOCO report, decided there would be no um, conduct proceedings? Um, I suppose technically that would have been the case. I was not then the discipline authority for the... Okay. Um, for the uh, and, in fact, was asked... Uh, to be the discipline authority in this particular case only at that stage right. by the Chief Constable in early 2017. Um, what I do know is that we had the, the IOCO report, uh, which was the determination of IOCO, which was received in November 2015, was followed by complaints from uh, four complainers um, in, I believe, March 2016. Um, which were referred to the Crown Office. So at that point, we had complaints which we, which we are bound to um, ensure are investigated. My understanding that was when those complaints were received, they were referred to the Crown Office to establish whether there was any criminality in the allegations. It was determined that, that uh, there was no criminality. Um, but it was agreed, I understand, at that point with the complainers, that those complaints would be pended until the IPT hearing, which took place in July, and then the IPT judgment and order in August. And it was at that point that the complaints then were referred to Durham Constabulary, and they were asked to conduct their independent complaints investigation. And the investigation or inquiry that you asked of Durham Constabulary, can you tell me what the status of the individuals that they would have interviewed would have been? Were they witnesses? Were they suspect? Were they accused? Under a complaints investigation, they would have been um, complainers, so four complainers in this case, and witnesses, um, essentially, to establish the, the substance and the um, recommendations in relation to those complaints. There are particular and very clearly defined in the conduct regulations um, issues around... Uh, conduct investigations, which put in place particular processes and procedures, and in some cases safeguards in relation to officers who may become what we call subject officers, those who are subject to uh, conduct investigation. Indeed, and the, and the legal opinion talks about that and the position for it challenge does. were that to be the case. But conversely, were it, was there the potential, given the direction that you had given to Durham Constabulary, was the potential for anyone interviewed to have been compromised if they were 
let's say, subsequently to become a subject constable or an accused? That was never raised with us by Durham Constabulary. Um, they, the, the, uh, there will always be the case when, when before a determination is made, um, that people may be spoken to, and then subsequently it becomes clear that um, perhaps they need to become a subject officer, i.e., to have their conduct investigated, because there may there is considered that there may be a possibility of misconduct or indeed gross misconduct. And in this case, that's the preliminary assessment that makes that decision. So. Um, Durham, in this case, Durham Constabulary identified that um, as a result of their investigation, they had identified a number of officers who, in their view, a decision needed to be taken about whether their conduct need to be needed to be investigated. And that was the preliminary assessment point which led to the conduct investigation. Okay, just for completeness, and did, did Durham interview the people that they subsequently say could be subject to disciplinary proceedings? I don't believe they did. And what, if anything, should this committee lead into the fact that DCC, ex-DCC Richardson, did not um, cooperate with Durham inquiry? Uh, I, I really can't say, I'm afraid. Their inquiry at that stage was independent, and um, I had n no role in, other than in providing, well, the organisation would have provided details of retired officers, for example. Uh, to Durham Constabulary. But, but nonetheless, you, for this, this instance, you are the disciplinary authority. Um, and uh, indeed, Mr Richardson previously had been the disciplinary authority. Would you not have anticipated full cooperation from your predecessor? Uh, may I say that actually Durham um, were con con conducting two uh, parallel conduct investigations, uh, criminal non-criminal complaints investigations at that stage. Uh, one on our behalf, and the other on behalf of the SPA. Um, so any issues around senior officers would have been part of the senior officer uh, complaints investigation, which was under the auspices of the SPA. Nonetheless, Mr Richardson could have been a witness. He could have been uh, were a serving officer a subject, uh, subject to investigation. Do, do you have no view on his unwillingness, his unwillingness to cooperate? I, I'm not. I'm simply saying that if approaches were made to him, I'm not aware of, of uh, what the conversation was, convener. I'm, I'm really not in a position to comment. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, Stuart. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I just wanted to be clear on sequencing. Uh, we have the uh, Chief Constable Barton submitting his investigation conclusions 12th of May 2017, and that is the end of one chapter, it seems to be. The next step, uh, as you've described it, is your role in uh, doing a preliminary assessment as to whether a, a conduct, misconduct inquiry would have to happen. In coming to your preliminary assessment view, what input would, separate from the submission uh, of the report from Durham, would there be from the Durham report? Would it simply be that you would go back to clarify points that you felt would need be, or was that now out of the picture, and that there would be no role in the preparation of the preliminary assessment uh, for Durham beyond the fact that they'd submitted a report which you would be drawing on? Um, I'm very fortunate I have to my left our um, conduct expert here, but if I, if I might just try to, to answer that by myself um, and then hand over to Superintendent McDowell um, to put me right on anything I may leave out. Um, the Durham's, Durham's uh, independent complaints investigation was complete and entire in itself. And it um, came to the conclusion that a number of uh, those complaints were upheld, some partially upheld and others not upheld. It also um, came to the conclusion that a number of officers, um, th th they took the view that there was prima facie a case that a number of officers, um, if their conduct was proven, that conduct might uh, be um, found to be, in fact, misconduct, to breach the standards of behaviour that we expect of professional police officers. Um, the the decision-making in that, then, um, is formed um, with, with support, um, in, in this case, for me, 
of an assessment of what's, what those particular matters that come out of. So we separate out the complaints issue, we look at those individual officers, and then I make a decision on the basis of what's provided to me from, in the Durham Constabulary Report in this case, is there that prima facie case which requires to be investigated. I determined that there was in relation to, um, there were originally eight officers that Durham spoke about. I determined that, um, looking at it in detail, that seven of those officers, there was a prima facie case that their conduct, if proven, could amount to gross misconduct, and that therefore a, a, um, an independent misconduct investigation should take place. But that was based on the Durham Constabulary Report. Uh, I understand that you, you use the... <clears throat> the phrase in coming to your conclusion, with support. And it was really kind of that I'm focused on. What was that support? Where did it come from? Did it involve going back to Durham to say, you've come up with this list, the, the charge sheet, if you like, um, to, to, to get further information so that the mm -hmm. preliminary assessment could be as complete and reasonable in, in all sorts of ways as, as would be necessary? That's kind of... I just want to know if, after the 17th of May, Durham were no longer part of the decision-making process, or were they still advising you? Okay. Well, I, I didn't go back to Durham um, other than to thank them for their right. report at that stage. I don't know if any of my colleagues in our conduct world um, felt that it would be appropriate or helpful to do that at that stage. Thank you, ma'am. Um, firstly, good afternoon, convener, committee members. Uh, Mr. Stevenson, there's there's not much more that I can actually add to the Deputy Chief Constable's interpretation of how we formulated that Regulation 10 preliminary assessment under the regulations. What I would, however, add is that the Durham report was conclusive and it was the information contained within that report that actually allowed us to formulate a preliminary assessment on the information contained within and, and in order that we could then after progress matters through the conduct regulations as required. So it was the Durham report that the that, that Reg 10 assessment was based on. Thank you. Rona? Thank you, Convener. Um, good afternoon. Um, I don't really want to labour the point too much, but I can just ask you a bit more about the terms of reference, because I, I feel I need clarification, and I'm still quite confused by it all. Um, Chief Constable Barton said it was, he was, three, it was three to four months into his um, investigation when he was told it wouldn't be an investigation and he doesn't, didn't have full investigatory powers and it would be an inquiry. Is that the period that you took over after that preliminary work had been done and you then decided to take legal action? Because I'm puzzled as to why the original remit from the Chief Constable, why he, why he didn't do that at the outset. Um, well, as I said earlier on, I wasn't actually, um, didn't, didn't become the decision maker for this until... Um, effectively the end of January and appointed officially on the 14th of February. Uh, the, the terms of reference were set in a letter to Durham Constabulary from the Chief Constable of Police Scotland on the 4th of August um, 2016. So Durham began work um, at, that, at that point um, and uh, I, as, as I say, I first engaged with Mr Barton in, I believe in January 2017, when their work had been underway since August. So, so that's what I'm trying to determine. Was it was it you having sight of that work that then decided I need to go and I, I, you know there's a different procedure needs to take place. I need to take legal advice here. Was it that was at that point? No, it, it, well, sorry, if I may, it wasn't. Uh -huh. It wasn't. Um, it, it was simply my initial conversations with Mr. Barton. Um, I spoke to him at the end of January, and then we had a meeting on the 30th of. January 2017 and we had an exchange of letters then about the terms of reference and of course as soon as he raised it with me then I wasn't aware till that point that there was a, an issue around a, 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 or a difference of, of view about the terms of reference and the extent of his inquiry but of course as soon as he raised it with me I had to listen very carefully to that um, and then I determined that I really needed to take some legal advice on the application of the conduct regulations in Scotland to that particular circumstance, so, and that's when I did that. So how long was that period, and you, you had been liaising with them before you realised you would need to take advice? Um, I would think, I can just, just give me a moment, um, I actually, we had a number of conversations, we had an exchange of letters um, in February, 
Um, and then I received uh, senior counsel's opinion on the 21st of March. So these, these, it was sequential. We talked about the terms of reference. Um, we we realised that we had a different professional view about that. Um, we discussed it. Um, I, I believe Mr. Barton said that he took legal advice. My recollection was that he mentioned that to me as well. We took legal advice. But I think importantly as well, I, I, I was very conscious of my responsibility to, to be open-minded about um, the views that, that uh, he had come to, but also to make sure that we were proceeding on a very sound legal basis. If I'm very honest, um, the issues of 2015, where we, um, as IOCO and IPT have determined, acted unlawfully, no legal advice was taken at that at point, and I was very keen to make sure that we were operating on a sound legal basis, hence taking legal advice. I actually took two different sets of legal advice, because during those conversations, and as we were getting the first set of um, senior counsel's opinion on the Scotland regulations, um, Mr Barton came, uh, made a, pro a specific proposal about how he might proceed under the regulations, and um, I asked for that to be put to, to senior counsel to look at it specifically, because again, I, I wanted to be open-minded about if that was an appropriate and, in fact, a better way to proceed, then I would take, you know, take advice on that and, and uh, we would go down that road if appropriate to all concerned. But that second set of senior counsel's advice on that very specific um, point was that uh, we could not be advised to go down that route and that, in fact, the Scotland regulations would not allow us to do that and to keep within the, the regulations themselves, which have the force of law. And it, I felt it was my responsibility to make an informed decision on two sets of legal advice, which had been very specific about those points. Okay. And I take it you stand by that decision today, that you did the right thing by taking that advice? I believe I did, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Margaret. Good afternoon. Mr Barton said, when I was given the inquiry, it was made clear to me the chief cons uh, by the Chief Constable that we're being asked to do an investigation. That means we can investigate, access all the documents and interview people so that we can make a recommendation on whether or not there was misconduct. Now, as part of that, he w said he wanted to interview senior officers and before that he wanted to see a chain of emails from these senior officers he was not allowed to do that. Legal privilege was um, given as the answer. Would you like to comment on that, Mr. Mr. Campbell? Good afternoon, Mrs. Mitchell. Yes, thank you for the opportunity to comment on that. Um, I was interviewed by Mr. Ellis um, in December of 2015, uh, 2016 as part of the investigation. Um, and I was asked to provide um, factual information, which I did, which essentially related to um, the interaction um, I'd had with this committee and its predecessor existence um, between the periods of de December 2015 and January 2016, which I did. Um, I was also asked to provide um, a chronology and copy of information passing between myself and the IPT in the period immediately following the hearing on the 22nd of July. Um, Mr Ellis um, asked me also to provide um, additional information um, surrounding the factual material. Sorry, excuse me just a minute. Um, and I indicated to him that I took the view that the material he was looking for um, was legally privileged um, and that I would need to get permission of the Chief Constable um, before privilege was waived, um, privilege vesting in my client, who was the Chief Constable. Um, the matter wasn't immediately pursued further with me um, at the time. Um, and when it was subsequently pressed, um, I offered advice to the Chief Constable um, about his entitlement to waive privilege um, as he saw fit. Um, and I also indicated to the Chief Constable um, that if he was so minded to do so, um, he might wish to avail himself of uh, independent legal advice on whether he wished to waive privilege. Um, I didn't withhold um, any material um, that Mr Ellis asked for that I was in a position to provide to him. This chain of um, emails what aspect of it did you think wasn't was covered by legal privilege? Well, Every single bit of the e emails between these sen senior officers? 
Well, I've, I've seen Mr Barton's evidence in that connection. I'm, I'm not in a position to comment on emails passing between senior officers. Um, I was only able to comment on material which was held within um, our own file, which concerned um, matters put to me for advice. So shouldn't you have made that distinction? On the basis of the emails I hold in my file, um, my advice is legal privilege kicks in, but of course you can see any of the emails that um, the senior uh, officers have have um, had in a chain of correspondence. That, that wasn't the inquiry that was made of me by Mr Ellis. I don't, I don't know whether he made that inquiry of anybody else, but he didn't make that inquiry of me. Well, he was quite clear that he asked to see the emails between people um, sent to each other. I think that was a fairly reasonable, and given his remit, investigate, aspect all documents and interview people so that um, you can make recommendation. He had to see everything. He does say quite clearly it's legitimate for a senior officer or a member of the Scottish Police Veteran Federation to sit down with their solicitor and be absolutely sure that those con uh, conversations are sacrosanct. That's a given. That's not what he was talking about here. May I, may I help at this point, because um, there was, uh, this, this issue came up with Mr uh, Barton in our discussions in January and February, February if I recollect, and we had an exchange of, um, we, we had discussions about it, and we also had an exchange of letters about it. And I've just noted that from my letter of the 22nd of February, I was able to confirm to him that we were late waiving legal privilege in relation to briefing documents that he required um, for his investigation and access, uh, another issue was access, access to telecoms product. Um, so at that point, again, as I'd said earlier, when Mr Barton, um, in, in the course of our conversation, raised one or two issues for me, with me that he felt that we needed to progress, then I was, as far as possible, able to resolve them. And I think that has a bearing on, on the point that you were just asking about, Mrs. It most certainly has. It took three months to do it, and it goes right to the heart of the, um, the allegation or the, um, the, the criticism here that the legal department was risk-averse that it was not open and it was not transparent. Would you care to reflect now, given um, the, the benefit of um, this analysis having made the subsequent three months later, three months later, of this correspondence then being released, that you might reflect and do things differently? Well, the, the correspondence that I sent to Mr Ellis was sent um, sooner than the, the date that Deputy Chief Constable Fitzpatrick refers to in terms of the briefing note to which he refers. Um, as, as far as risk of errors is concerned, um, my role in providing advice to Deputy Chief Constable Fitzpatrick um, and to colleagues uh, in the Professional Standards Department is, I think, to be risk aware uh, rather than risk of errors, namely to be aware of the risks that would arise if certain courses of action uh, were followed and to offer advice uh, on that premise. Um, and your advice was to not release? No, with respect, my advice was, was not against releasing or not releasing. My advice to Chief Constable was, it's your privilege and it's for you to determine whether it's waived. It's not for me to waive the privilege on your behalf. So what took three months? If you looked at this, the request was made, um, I would have thought you passed that info. Did it take you three months to come to that conclusion or did it take um, DCC... Or who, who, who made the decision ultimately that they would be released? It, it, it wasn't a decision which was taken by me, uh, Mrs Mitchell. Um, I initially reflected back to Deputy Chief Constable Livingston uh, the day after I'd seen Mr Ellis and explained to him that in part a request had been made for access to privileged material. Um, it was suggested to me that that might be quite an unusual request and I should reflect that back to Mr Ellis, which I did the following day. Why did it take three months to release these emails? They were subsequently released. As I say, as I said earlier, Mrs. Mitchell, when, when it was raised with me by Mr. Uh, Barton, uh, when we had our discussions at the end of January and uh, in February, it was one of the issues that he raised with me, and I was able to confirm to him that we, having had a discussion with the Chief Constable, that we would be happy to provide the briefing documents that he was uh, he was requesting. Can I put it another way? Is there a, a problem with communication? It took three months, and you still haven't told me why. In an investigation that should have been going smoothly, these emails, it turns out, should have been released. 
were subsequently released, but it took three months to do it. Why? Well, having come into the issue at the end of January and the beginning of February, being appointed to be the decision maker on the 14th of February, I was able to confirm to Mr Barton on the 22nd of February as a result of him raising it with me, that we would be providing him with that material. So you're saying so, um, you only came to it late, it was somebody else's problem? I, I'm, I'm saying that as soon as I became aware of it, Mrs Mitchell, I um, sought to have the matter resolved between us, and it are was resolved. Are there lessons to be learned here? There are indeed, and the lessons that are set out, as I said, in Mr Barton's report, and our discussions with him along the way form the ba basis of a significant amount of organisational learning for us, not only in relation to the original matters of the IPT and IOCO, but subsequently. Yeah, we've had these platitudes before, um, DC um, Fitzpatrick, with respect, but you know the fact you can't come today being fully aware of this evidence last two weeks ago, that there was this gap, and you're kind of reassuring us that, you know, uh, we, we've kind of moved on and, and everything was quite amicable at the end. It wasn't. There was no criminality found. It was merely inept. And I'm afraid that's what's coming over today. Can I ask about the data protection and the addresses of the officers, retired officers, was, which was refused? Whose decision was that and for what, be, for, for what reason? Can I take that? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, once again, uh, any, any, any organisation, as we know, has responsibilities for data. The data uh, legislation sets that out. Um, retired officers are effectively members of the public, and we have a responsibility for their data, which includes their personal details. Um, again, Mr Barton raised with me uh, that this Can seemed I stop to be you taking there? some Before time. Before we even got there, then um, it said, but lawyers in Police Scotland said they were not allowed to know uh, we were not allowed to know where these police officers lived. Now, this was somebody, it wasn't just um, a, a member of the public or, or somebody interested. This was the person in charge of the investigation. M Mr. It's really a legal question, this one, and I feel I have to ask Mr. Duncan, uh, Mr. Campbell, about this. Thank you. Um, the first I became aware of um, having access to retired officers as an issue. Um, was when I was shown um, a letter, which I think is before you, from Mr Barton, dated the 7th of February. Um, I think I was shown the letter that day or possibly the next day. Um, I, I think when one looks at the official transcript of Mr Barton's evidence um, on the 22nd of February, you might form the impression that I or one of my colleagues had already given some advice or instruction that home addresses were not to be released. Um, I can, I, I hope, reassure you um, that that's not the case. We, we hadn't had any involvement in the matter um, up until receipt of the letter of the 7th of February. Um, I discussed that with Deputy Chief Constable Fitzpatrick. I think the next day uh, we discussed a number of matters which are reflected in her letter of the 13th of February. And one of them is the way in which we propose to resolve the issue um, of access namely to facilitate access, which is what we wanted to do, but to ensure that we were doing so in a lawful and proportionate way. So if you didn't actually give legal advice, was Mr Barton told by someone else that that was legal advice? If so, it was erroneous because two months later, two months later, they got the information about where the retired police officers lived. How was that resolved? Uh, in my letter to... Um Mr Barton of the 13th of February, we undertook to resolve that and in fact it was at that stage in hand. We were doing as we were required to do in relation to personal information, which was contacting the individuals and asking them if they were happy for us to provide that information, i.e. their contact details, to Durham Constabulary. If I can ask one final question, it goes on to professional standards. Mr Barton <coughs> said um, that... He moved as fast as he could. Um, times we paused for preliminary assessments. At any time in our car, the officers in the professional standards of the plan could not have done, uh, could have done a prelim preliminary assessment. If they had done that, they could have switched the process under their ACRIN rules into investigation, and they chose not to do that. And this is it. We gave them ample opportunity on a number of occasions to switch to a full investigation. We were balked 
is it Bolt? That's what he says. Um, in speaking to some people because we were given, uh, not given the addresses and we were balked because we were not allowed um, to see what were assessed as being legally privileged documents, although there were, they were not. And um, I just wanted to comment on the timeliness. Five months seems to have been delayed in, in this process. Mr McDowell? Thank you, Mrs. Mitchell. Uh, I, 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 I must confess I'm somewhat perplexed as to how we could suddenly jump from a conduct investigation straight in, so a complaints investigation straight into a, a conduct investigation. Um, as the conduct portfolio lead for Police Scotland, um, I've already discussed the, the Regulation 10 preliminary assessment process. That Regulation 10 process follows on to an appointment of an investigating officer by the Deputy Chief Constable to investigate misconduct matters. Legally, in Scotland, we are not allowed to investigate police misconduct unless that process has been undertaken. Now, as, as I mentioned to Mr Stevenson, the basis on which we formulated that Regulation 10 preliminary assessment was on the conclusion, or was on the concluded Durham report, which was conclusive. We could not, prior to that, have quite simply appointed an investigating officer without having gone through that legal regulate, regulatory process. I remain unconvinced by the uh, explanations today, and I'm somewhat concerned that areas were, were in the public domain last week. Um, I'm asking about, and we still don't have answers. Perhaps you'll reflect on that as we move forward. Okay, Margaret. Next question is from Ben. Thank you, Kavira. Good afternoon. I, I want to go back to the legal opinions and uh, Deputy Chief Constable Fitzpatrick, you said that decisions were made on the 30th of January concerning the terms of reference and consideration about whether to seek. Was that when the decision to seek senior counsel was made? I, I'm afraid I can't recall exactly when the decision was made. My first, my first meeting with Mr Barton was on the 30th of January. Okay. And, uh, we, and, and we were talking about those issues at that point. Okay. Um, so, in, in follow-up to that meeting, I have two, two real questions. One, why was senior counsel sought rather than internal legal advice? What was the, the position around that? Two, was Mr Barton content with the process of seeking senior counsel? Was he in agreement with that? Um, firstly, I, I wanted to take um, the, the best possible advice to make an informed decision about this. Um, and of course, of course, internal legal advice is part of that. Um, but senior counsel's advice would, of course, be on a very specific points. And um, I think it's common for most organisations and, and many police services to seek sen senior counsel's advice on particularly important or complex matters. So uh, I'm not suggesting for a moment that I couldn't have had advice in-house, as it were, and in fact was receiving that advice where that was appropriate. But again, you know, senior counsel is called senior counsel for a reason. And I wanted to make, uh, make sure that we were getting the, uh, as it were, the best possible uh, focus on this. I certainly discussed that with Mr Barton. I, s I made him aware that we were taking advice, I think on both occasions when he came back with his specific proposal as well, um, and, and was very frank in discussing the content of that advice with him. Um, I believe, uh, I, I know he said to the committee previously that he himself took legal advice. And, and ultimately, as our exchange of letters um, suggests, and as he refers to in his final letter to us when his report was received, we effectively agreed to differ, but we agreed to proceed on the basis of the legal advice we had received as Police Scotland. Mm -hmm. But there was no ob objection at the time in terms of from him in terms of instructing senior counsel? I don't think so at all. No, no, no. Um, um, I don't re recollect that at all. We, we had a number of conversations about it. We, we knew the points on which we differed professionally about our interpretation of the Scottish regulations. And I, I hope I was very open with him that that's what I intended to do. I asked the question simply because of the, the, the position that he takes that Police Scotland was over-legalistic, to use his phrase, in, 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 the, uh, in the process. 
and it, from instructing a senior counsel uh, in, a, in a previous role before this, I know that it can take longer, and, and perhaps that, that, that led to the, the time delay. Also, it can often be the case that different legal opinions are sought from different uh, advocates. Was that ever considered? Um, I'm trying to say if I specifically considered that. I don't think I did. I was actually, as you suggest, quite mindful of time. Um, I, w I asked that for senior counsel's view to be taken. Um, I didn't specify which senior counsel that should be. I'm not a lawyer myself. Um, and uh, in fact, because the two things were taken so closely together, it was a, a benefit of time effectively to have the general point uh, taken, opinion on, and then the very specific proposal taken in the same context. And the, the legal opinions, uh, particularly at 51 and 52 in the, the first legal opinion, state the, the, the risk in, in, in senior counsel's view of judicial review. Was Mr Barton receptive to that risk? Did he understand it? Um, well, I, I, he must have been receptive because we ultimately agreed to proceed on the basis of um, my decision to follow the legal advice that I had received. Um, and it is a matter... It, um, you know, I was very clear that this is not a matter in abstract, that we have, that Police Scotland has actually um, been judicially reviewed on this matter, um, a very similar matter previously. So this was not an issue about an abstract discussion of what might happen. So the decision to take a legal opinion and the the opinion that was given was, was not questioned or... or a uh, we, we dismissed by it. Mr Barton. I, I, I never found Mr Barton dismissal, uh, dismissive at all, and I hope he didn't find me dismissive. I think we were two professionals who both appreciated the importance and the complexity of this particular issue, both um, very determined to do, uh, to do right by um, the issue and the people involved, in particular the complainers, and to uh, take this forward in an effective way. Uh, we agreed to differ. We both, as I understand it, took legal advice, and then we agreed to proceed on the basis of the legal advice that we had received. And the the debate over the the interpretation of the 24 regulations prolonged the investigatory process, um, and it's been stated that this had an adverse effect on the individuals who were involved. Do, do you accept that, or? Um, I, I have accepted that uh, and had the opportunity, for which I was grateful, to apologise to three of the four complainers uh, on the 1st of March in person and by letter to all four complainers on the same day for not only the failings which uh, occurred in 2015 but for the subsequent impact on them and their families. Um, I'm mindful of that. I know Mr Barton was very mindful of it, of it. The discussions that we were having when I took this on in um, formally in February and March led um, Mr Barton to then go on to conclude his investigation and his report with, was with us in early May, the 12th of May, I believe. And mindful of all of that, what steps will need to be taken to avoid any confusion around the application of the 2014 regulations with regard to any future inquiries or investigations that need to be carried out? Well, I, I would say that actually um, the discussions that we had had with, and I had had particularly with Mr Barton and with the Durham investigation team, you know, not only did we get a very thorough and diligent and professional report from them, which enabled us to progress the processes, but uh, you'll then recall we then went on to develop terms of reference for the Police Service of Northern Ireland to conduct the conduct investigation. And from my point of view, it was important that we were very clear about those. We both understood exactly the legislative framework we'd be operating under, that PS and I were, were happy with that. So for my personal learning was to take that, um, the discussions that I'd had with Mr Barton about 
terms of reference and the difference of view which had arisen into the very early discussions with the Police Service of Northern Ireland in ensuring agreement on their terms of reference. So despite the, the delay, the, the admitted delay and the potential damage that it can have, there's a, there's, there's a constructive outcome of this in terms of future investigations. Indeed, we have a lot of lessons to learn, and as I say, we've already put that into practice in, in asking the PSNI to do the work they have done. Thank you, Convener. Um, a supplementary from Daniel and then William. So I'd just like to ask just a technical clarification on the, the nature of the disagreement. My, my understanding is that that we are, uh, in Scotland we have a separation between the complaint and then the, the uh, subsequent uh, investigation uh, and that the, the contention of Police Scotland is that, that the invest in terms of the investigation, that, that that investigator cannot have any previous involvement in the complaint handling because that that would undermine the, 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 the requirement for the investigating officer to be impartial, which is in the police regulations. Is that the correct understanding of, of, of kind of where the, the crux of this disagreement is? Is that the, correct? That, that, was the, that, as I understand it as well, was the crux of the disagreement. That formed the basis of the legal advice. And as I think I said earlier in answer to Mr McPherson's question earlier, this was, this was not an abstract issue for us. It is no. a point on which we had previously been judicially reviewed and had to concede that point. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Liam? Thanks, Community. Good afternoon. Um, I think, a little like others, I'm, I'm struggling a bit to reconcile the evidence that we had on the 22nd of February from Ch Chief Constable Barton, uh, which was of the moment reflecting back on what had happened, and at that stage still felt uh, moved to make some fairly serious criticisms, and, and the more reassuring tone that you've sought to strike today. And I, I think that's probably material um, for, for this committee insofar as it, it tends to suggest that when it comes to lessons learned, you're more reassured than Chief Constable Barton um, and, and his colleagues are at the moment. And I sort of leave that um, hanging there for the moment. I mean, on the basis of the evidence we've had, a couple of things that have uh, leapt out at me. It just seems to me staggering that the issue around access to retired officers would not have been identified as a potential issue resolved, if not in terms of each individual case, but resolved in terms of handling and agreed with Durham at the point where um, the, uh, the investigation was initiated. I mean, I just cannot understand why that issue almost came as a surprise and out of left field after Durham had been asked to, um, to, to, to undertake an investigation. Would that not just be standard? procedure that there would undoubtedly and almost inevitably be a request at some stage to make an approach to retired officers, in which case, how was Police Scotland going to respond? I can understand why you might need to seek permission, but I cannot for the life of me understand why it is that you would not anticipate that uh, arising in the, in the early stages, not just at some point, but in the early stages of the investigation. I think you've quite rightly identified an area of, of learning for us in terms of preparation for these things and something that we took into our discussions with PSNI about what, what they would need in order to facilitate their subsequent independent conduct investigation. I, again, in, in, in passing, and it really is only in, in passing, I think some of what Chief Constable Barton was referring to in terms of um, a, a, an attitude and a, and, a, and a lack of transparency was reflected for me in terms of the, um, the level of redaction in the reports that were handed to us. I, I entirely understand and respect um, the, the requirement to, um, to redact um, reports of, of this nature, but it seemed to me the extent of the redaction, including information that was in the public domain, um, I think spoke to um, an attitude that, as I say, um, Chief Constable Barton, during his evidence session, um, uh, was, was moved to suggest was, was uh, an overly secretive uh, mm. a, a, a approach. But can I turn to the, the issue of the kind of pastoral care, where there isn't any, and there's never been any disagreement, is around the fact that um, four individuals concerned were, I, I think Chief Constable Barton said, gravely wronged. I think you've said um, that you were determined to do the right um, thing by the, the complainers. Um, but as far as I understand, the IOCO, the IOCO um, uh, reported to Police Scotland um, in July 2015, and Chief Constable Barton then suggested that the first contact that was made by Police Scotland with the four affected was in February 2016. And why on earth did it take that long for Police Scotland, having been made aware um, 
of IOCO's uh, concerns and the nature of those concerns. Why did it take, whatever it is, seven months to make an approach to, to those that are affected? I, I mean, I appreciate this predates mm -hmm. your involvement, but I, I mean, I, I, again, I find that absolutely staggering. I, I actually, I, I'm afraid I don't know I, I, I don't know why it took so long. I do know, well, while we're on the subject of learning, that having been asked to become the decision maker in this, in um, officially on the 14th of February, but in discussions with Mr. Barton in late January, um, our discussions, and, and we agreed wholeheartedly on this, I was determined to offer to meet with the complainers as soon as possible and to offer them a personal and what I described to them and uh, as in my letters to them a wholehearted and unreserved apology to them uh, and I, I touched on it briefly earlier that was not only for the failings that um, the IOCO and IPT had identified in 2015 in terms of our processes and procedures around the communications data, but also for the impact on them and their families in the time of those acts, but also in the time since then. I was very grateful that three of the complainers agreed to meet with me, um, and I completely understood that a fourth did not choose to do that. Mm. I, I, I mean, my understanding is that that apology was was welcomed and, and was um, acknowledged for being as as fulsome as you suggest. But I, it, I, just to get this this clear, you were apologising um, not just for what happened, but the impact that uh, that it had. Was it also an apology for the lack of ongoing engagement and, and seeming concern for the well-being um, of the? existing and retired um, officers throughout this this process. I mean, we've had colleagues of yours, the um, uh, Acting Chief Constable Livingston has made great play in a number of evidence sessions uh, about the priority he attaches to the well-being of, of officers and of staff. And it just seems to me, in this instance, th that was that was glaringly absent throughout this process and potentially ongoing. I mean, I don't know the outcome of the discussions you've had, but, but presumably that impact is is ongoing. Certainly the complaints don't necessarily feel as if um, this, this has resolved the, the, the matter for them. So presumably there's a commitment from Police Scotland um, to continue in an ongoing basis subject to, to willingness uh, on the part of the complainants to, to engage, to work through what, what may bring a resolution to this. One of the striking things, and I think it's the case for anybody uh, when you sit down with someone, was um, for me when I spoke individually to the three complainers um, who agreed to meet with me on the 1st of March 2017, was to listen to them, to listen to what the impact on them had been. So, uh, of course, it was my intention to, and I did apologise to them directly, individually, but also to hear from them what the impact on them had been, and not just on them, on their families. Um, the work that Mr Livingston, I think, has previously spoken to the committee uh, in respect of well-being certainly needs to include our processes and procedures in relation to officers um, serving, you know, whatever their status and whatever the circumstances of our relationship with them um, in the future. But, but just to be clear, that that meeting on the 1st of March it, it is not uh, an end point, notwithstanding the fact that the apology that was being sought was, was offered at that stage, but there's an ongoing commitment um, to engagement if that's seen to be, uh, felt to be necessary um, by those involved? If, if, if indeed, yes, absolutely, if indeed it is. Um, we, we, as you will know, a number of those complainers have retired but um, we still have a responsibility to uh, uh, any of those who has, has not retired, um, certainly. Uh, and you know, this, this was probably one of the most significant points of learning for us, um, that there was a very long gap which you've identified, and that um, with Durham's help, we were able to, I was able to meet with them uh, in, at the beginning of March was an important part of what I felt was my responsibility at that time. Okay. Thank you. Um, Lucy C. Fitzpatrick, a, a lot of people, given the profile that this issue has had and the seriousness of it, which has been acknowledged by Police Scotland, will be quite astonished that the outcome of this is effectively you've learnt, you've learnt issues, but no one's been culpable in any way. You have a range of disposals. You could reprimand someone, you could caution someone, you could send them for additional training, but none of that. 
wh where are the individuals who have been involved in this? Where are they now? Because concern has been expressed to this committee that these people, albeit, and I readily accept that they're acquitted, are now in more promoted posts. And the reason I raise that is because there are genuine concerns about reputational damage and the signal that that sends out. Can you comment on how, after all this, no one even gets spoken to? Uh, well, in, in fact, that's not quite the case. What, um, were, the, what were the disposals then, the, please? The disposals. So seven officers were the subject of PSNI's independent conduct uh, inquiry. And if I can uh, quote from the PSNI investigation report, they found that a number of allegations were proven on the balance of probabilities, but no evidence of willful acts of misconduct. What they did describe was... Um, where there was no evidence of willful actions, there was clearly recklessness, and that chimed entirely with the IOCO and IPT findings that we had been reckless as an organisation. PSNI found that those individuals, or some of those individuals, had been reckless um, in their own individual behaviour, and that they, PSNI also identified failure of leadership systems and processes. What, uh, of the seven officers, four officers were subject to what we call improvement action, which is a disposal um, aimed at um, focusing on why they had behaved in that way previously and them taking action to make sure that that did not occur again. And three individuals who PSNI determined were very, that's my word, peripheral to these issues, um, no further action was taken. So there, for four of the individuals, improvement action, which is action plans to make sure that, that, that uh, those actions do not, um, are not in future likely to lead to adverse outcomes, um, were put in place. And how many of the seven have subsequently been promoted? I'm afraid I don't have that information, Convener. I'm happy to provide it to the committee if that would help. Thank you very much. Liam, I understand you. Just following up on that, Convener, um, obviously we discussed earlier the, uh, the involvement or the lack of access to um, uh, officers that are uh, now retired. I mean, presumably any improvement actions can't be applied to those that have retired. Did the PSNI report shed any light on that? You've talked about reckless behaviour and, and, and a lack of leadership. Um, one would assume that something more than improvement actions would be required in, in the event of, of rec reckless actions. So. Did PSNI have anything to say about um, the behaviour involvement of retired officers and had they still been in the force, whether or not um, more serious uh, measures might, needed, uh, might have been necessary and appropriate in those circumstances? Uh, yes, they did. Um, PSNI observed that they had not been able to engage with officers who had retired um, because, of course, the, the conduct... Um, uh, regulations fall when an officer retires uh, from policing and so they'd not been able to engage with them and they did observe that on the basis of what they knew they felt that um, their, that other action might have been appropriate but of course they did observe they had not been able to engage with or interview those officers so that was at, the, at that stage a judgment as opposed to something they could say was a matter of fact to is, us. Is that then something that you can take learning from even if there isn't action that you can take because of the status of, 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 uh, of the officer being retired? Is, that le is there something from that that you can take in terms of uh, lessons learned going forward? Um, uh, to, the, to the extent that it's important that, um, you know, that, that you learn from all of these things, the, 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 the issue here, of course, is the conduct regulations, which um, differ from those in England and Wales, and in which there is no uh, there's no way of, of um, compelling, if you like, individuals who've retired to engage with a conduct investigation. And in fact, the conduct investigation has no um, locus for them at all because they are no longer serving as police officers. So that actually is a regulatory issue. That particular point is a regulatory issue, not something we have control over. Is that, well, in the sense, um, given the, the, the role of, of this parliament, perhaps, um, to, to look at where regulation is and isn't working. Is that something that you would be um, uh, supportive of Parliament looking at? If, is it a deficiency in the way that regulations are, are structured now that um, uh, by, by, by dint of retiring, um, an officer can escape any sort of sanction 
um, uh, for okay, not criminal offences, but mm. but very very serious uh, misdemeanours on their part. I think there's a in policing there's a range of views about that. Um, I do know that we the conduct regulations 2014 clearly have been in place now for four years, over four years I think, and we. Um, there's a, there is learning about the regulations, just as there has been organisational learning for us all the way through in, in other matters in relation to CCU and comms data and so on. So um, it, it's, it's very wise to keep these things under review, I think. Thank you. Uh, DC C. Fitzpatrick, are you able to tell us why you can't publish the PSNI report, please? Um, I, I'm going to again look to Superintendent McDowell to keep me right on this, but um, my understanding of the conduct regulations is that, um, again, unlike some of the arrangements which exist in England and Wales, where, for example, hearings may be in public, in particular conduct matters, that does not apply in Scotland. And there is a presumption that, that um, in the conduct regulations that misconduct um, proceedings, i.e. The, the conduct of the misconduct, um, will be in private and that people have a, um, a, an expectation, therefore, of privacy. It, it, it's, spe it's specifically the report, even in redacted form, why it's not possible. And, and if I can express some surprise as the disciplinary authority, I would have anticipated that the small number of regulations that comprise the conduct regulations, conduct regulations you would have a full grasp of. So. Uh, well, I'm sorry if the committee thinks I, I don't do... Uh, don't no, I'm only going class. with the comments you've said that uh, your understanding, I mean, I would yeah. have thought you... Would, yeah. My understanding is that the, there is an issue around the um, misconduct process uh, proceedings being in private. Um, I'm going to ask Mr McDowell, as my left-hand man here, to be able to put me right on this, if indeed I have misinterpreted them, Convener. Thank you, ma'am. You, you absolutely do. Um, convener, uh, misconduct, police misconduct proceedings in Scotland are private proceedings. Um, again, that, that is not um, similar to, to England and Wales. Um, and as a result of that, and, and I, I don't just think this refers to this specific matter in terms of the PSNI investigation, I think it's important that we maintain that degree of consistency, um, not just for regulatory compliance, but for all other misconduct regulations. Um, which are not put into the public domain. Okay, c can I ask then, DCC Fitzpatrick, is, is that information, w w was that shared with the, the complainers, that there was to be no proceedings? Um, I certainly uh, wrote to the complainers on the 30th of June um, with the complaints um, investigation uh, results, very lengthy letters to them. But that's the Durham and report, the, the PSNI report. Right. Uh, I'm trying to look now. Did I write yes. to them? The 15th of January. The 15th of January I have here. Ah, oh, that's right. Sorry. Um, on the 15th of January, when um, we were... Um, speaking to the subject officers and letting them know the outcome of the conduct investigations into them. I'm sorry, just, it took me a moment there. There have been so many letters in this matter that I um, hand, letters were hand-delivered from me to each of the four complainers on that day. So they heard on the same day as the officers who'd been subject to the misconduct investigation heard the outcome. And are you able to share how they responded to your decision not to institute proceedings? Um, I think that's a matter for them, effectively, convener. OK. Uh, um, on the point of the retention of material and the recent exchanges about that, um, Police Scotland use quite an unusual phrase, if you don't mind me saying, and that is the, any material on Police Scotland databases, quote, which does not reflect the truth. Can you explain what that means, please? Um, yes, I can, convener, I hope. Um, we... Uh, the, the committee will be aware that the original material which um, led to the, the IOCO breach was one set of material, um, and the IPT judgment governs the disposal, if you like, of that, of that material, ultimately. But also, as, um, as officers, as four of the complainers, three of whom were serving at officers at the time, uh, 
I understand that they had some concerns, quite rightly, about other material that might be held about them on, on any of our databases. So that might be, for example, our HR database, our um, professional standards database, and so on. So w when we talk about material that doesn't reflect the truth of these matters, it is any material which the complainers feel doesn't effectively represent the truth. The um, the IPT material is slightly different. That's governed by, sorry, the, the IPT order governs the material which relates to the authorizations and the comms data. But I wanted to speak to, and in speaking to the three complainers as I did on the 1st of March, I wanted to assure them of um, the fact that if there was any material which they felt didn't reflect what had happened truthfully, then we would be very open to removing that material from any of our databases, our intelligence, HR, complaints or other databases. Thank you. Um, the complainers talk about seeking the delivering our remedy. Do you think that Police Scotland has delivered a remedy for people who have been wronged? Um, I, I think there are two, two aspects to that. I suppose one is, is um, the effective remedy which is referred to by the IPT. Um, which was d determined could only come about by an independent investigation into what's happened. Effectively, we've had two independent investigations. I know from speaking to the complainers when I met them on the 1st of March last year that um, they feel very gravely wronged in this matter. Um, and so, for me, there's that separate issue about what people feel personally is an effective remedy. And again, I can't answer for the complainers on that, because I know that is a very personal um, view. Do you think it's legitimate that the field continue to feel wrong? I absolutely, um, and as I said to them when I met them, and I have repeated in my letters to them, I feel we failed them as an organisation, absolutely, and that we continued to fail them by not uh, being in contact with them, and I continue to offer them my wholehearted apologies for that failing. Okay, well, my final question, uh, how, how, what reassurance can you give the people of Scotland that we won't see a repetition of this abuse? Um, I've spoken about organisational learning, and I think it's very easy, it's very easy to use that phrase, organisational learning. I also think that um, it's very legitimate to make sure that those lessons are actually implemented and they do affect change. Um, the committee will be aware that Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary in Scotland um, carried out a very early um, assurance review of our CCU arrangements, our counter-corruption arrangements, that has led to really substantial change. The 39 recommendations they made have all either been completed, three finally proposed for closure now, and in fact HMICS are currently back in force with us carrying out a, um, a further review of the um, a, a further review of the uh, our progress on implementing those recommendations so there is independent assurance around whether we have moved on from those days thank you indeed well, committee will be seeking an update from the inspector on that any further questions can i just comment on one thing um, on the uh, information that should be withdrawn, you, you sort of said it was regulation, it didn't quite fully um, reflect the truth. We were told quite bluntly it was made up, and can I suggest to you, unless we speak very plainly in these kind of um, terms, to say a spade is in fact a spade and we're holding up our hands to that and we will address it, then this lack of openness, transparency and accountability and how the senior management, and we're not talking about the rank and file, are getting on with their job on a daily basis basis, despite all this that is happening at senior letter. Until that openness, transparency and accountability is, is at the very heart of what you do, then we're going to be here on a regular basis. I don't know, do you, do you wish to respond to that, um, DCC Fitzpatrick? We are certainly very keen that there's maximum engagement with the inspectorate and following up these 39 recommendations. Indeed, convener, and if I might, might just follow up Mrs Mitchell's point, we have actually asked, and Durham have very kindly agreed, to provide independent assurance to the process of removing material which, um, as I've said, doesn't reflect the truth on all of our databases. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, can I thank you all for your evidence? Um, and we now move to private session.